Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. The Sparkfile podcast may contain profanity and other adult content. Please use your discretion. When I bump into something that inspires me, I dump it in my Sparkfile. To be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my Sparkfile. I jump into my Sparkfile. Welcome to the Spark File, where we believe that everyone is creative, but smart, creative people don't go it alone. I'm Laura Camion. And I'm Susan Blackwell. And we are creativity coaches who help people fear less, create more, and bring their creative visions to life. If you're an OG member of the Spark File community, welcome back, Sparkler. If you're joining us for the first time, hi, welcome, friend. Know that just by listening to this podcast, you're joining a warm and wonderful clan of creatives. But you may be asking yourself, what exactly is a Spark File? A Spark File is a place where you consistently collect all of your inspirations and fascinations. If you're like us and you're making stuff all the time or you want to be making stuff all the time, you know, if you're not careful, your campfire of creativity can flicker out. But don't despair. We're collecting kindling in the form of fresh ideas, images, and inspiration that spark creativity and peak curiosity to light a fire under our collective asses to make things like this podcast. Or a piece of creative self-expression about or from destruction. Ooh. Every episode, we're going to reach into our spark files and exchange some sparks. And from time to time, we're going to talk to some folks who spark us as well. You know what that means, Laura? That means we have more sparks than we can possibly use in this lifetime. It sure does. So if something lights you up, we encourage you to take that thing and make something out of it. So without further ado, let's open up the The spark spark file. file. Hi, Laura Cammy. Hi, Susie Q. How are you doing over there, Laura Camion? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We are well into fall and the weather is beautiful. And like if I could live in this space for, you know, maybe 10 months out of the year, I'd be thrilled. I know you do love fall and I love it too. And it's been, I'm sure by the time people are listening to this, they might be like shivering on a, in a snow drift. Like, yeah, gray, mushy snow of it all maybe, but. But I will say, I think it's been, is this true where you are? It's been a beautiful autumn. Has it's it been, been true? It's been exquisite. Ah. Oh. Truly exquisite. I think it was yesterday morning. I looked out the window and I was like, oh, look at that. All, not all the leaves, but most of the leaves had finally dropped. Mm. And we're to the, se- the season that we call brown sticks. <laughs> brown sticks is after autumn, but before winter. <laughs> brown stick season it's brown stick season but Uh, it's a unseasonably warm day today the day mm -hmm. we're recording this and i am just so thankful for the fall that we've had it's been beautiful same me too and you know what else is good in life there's so much that is just a godforsaken shit show but you know what is good what 
going to tell you there's a few things that are good. Okay. Tell me what. One thing that is good is we had, we had a blaze class session today where mm-hmm. people were doing creativity shares. We had an ignite class session today where yeah, people we were did. learning about creativity shares and the yeah, spark did. file feedback process. And I have to say those two classes and the people in those classes were so fucking great. They lit you up, didn't they? And they lit my pants on fire. I have to say as well, it's, oh, I just feel so, um, I feel grateful. It is inspiring and um, random thing. I really hate when I quote like some tile that I saw on Instagram, (laughs) but I'm going to do it. Do it. Quote that meme. In fairness, I think it was Deepak Chopra's, I think. But it was something along the lines of like, imagine if you woke up tomorrow and all you had were the things you were grateful for today. Oh, 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 oh my that God. just got super clear for me. Do you know yes. what I mean? And, and Did, uh, were you just looking around and be like, I'm grateful for you. And you I'm and grateful that, for this, you. I'm grateful for this. I'm that grateful. is an interesting exercise. It really truly is. And I do gratitude stuff every day, but it did make me expand a little bit of like, Laura. Oh yeah. And I'm grateful for this. And I'm grateful. Yeah. Laura, it might be a Instagram meme tile, but I have to say, I've never heard that before. It's powerful. It is. And it makes me think it, it makes me think of my spark today. Oh, get to that in a second. And it also makes me think of the other day in, uh, I attend this gym. I think I've talked about it on the podcast before. Mark Fisher Fitness. Yeah. It's live classes that they teach virtually over Zoom yeah. so that I can live wherever I want to live and I can still Zoom on in and get my yeah. fitness on with a group of people whom I adore. Love Mark Fisher Fitness, love the instructors, love the community there. And our beloved fitness teacher, Chris Crothers, who I've talked about on the podcast before because he's written a, a haiku every day yes. for like 10 years. Yes. Chris I Crothers has been training to run the New York Marathon, <gasps> which is happening tomorrow. Wow. And the day before yesterday, he had an appendicitis attack and <gasps> had to have emergency surgery. So he was, it was like, no oh. marathon for you. Oh. But for the name game in our class, we always do a name game. As we do at the Spark File, we call it a Spark Round. But for the name game, each person said something that they were grateful for. And I just want to say, Chris Crothers, I'm grateful for modern medicine. It's not yieldy pioneer times. And you will live to run another day because you could have good health care and you have health yes. insurance. I'm grateful for that too. Yes. And I'm grateful for, I'm just grateful for you, Chris Crothers. But that gratitude game, I'm telling you, sometimes I'll make people in my life, Laura and I sometimes play this game where if we're having kind of a shit day, mm-hmm. I'll be like, can we do the gratitude game? We haven't done it yeah. in a minute, but I do like no. the gratitude game. I, I, I'll do it with Wes too. Like, I'll just be like, babe, let me tell you this thing I saw on Instagram and let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about <laughs> all the things we're grateful for. Yeah. In the same way that worry is not insurance against bad things happening. Gratitude isn't insurance against it either, but I do think that habituating gratitude does change your thoughts and therefore the chemical response to your body and your feelings. And it, I do think, yeah, I don't know, it makes life feel better. And I have to believe that it contributes just the general sense of well-being. Um, sure. I feel like it does give you like the shot of dopamine when you think about all those things that you love and you're, you know, thankful for. I also think about, I'm going to, I don't remember the name of the, of the woman who wrote about it. I think then Oprah talked about it, but I don't think it was Oprah who we referenced first time, but the concept of, um, when you can get grateful for things in your life, when everything's going well. Yes. You can exercise the muscle Mm -hmm. so that when things are not going well, you had talked about somebody like living through like a hurricane or a tornado. That's right. And how, if you've practiced that gratitude, if you have a real gratitude Mm -hmm. practice in place, this is making me think, I I feel like I've fallen off my more like, formal daily gratitude practice Mm -hmm. and I could stand to get back into it. But I also think it's fun to play that gratitude game more frequently. 
it's great anytime it's like stop drop and roll right just stop drop and gratitude at stop any drop moment. and gratitude and it's if you're like i'm telling you like if you're not in a great mood you play that gratitude game this change will come over you it will it'll reset your day yeah laura say something you're grateful for i'm grateful for the life that um, Wes and I have co-created together and the bah. life that you and I have co-created together, Suze. Bah. Yeah. I love that. How about you? I'm going to say I am grateful for people in my life, there are several, who can hang in through tough times and even Ooh. conflict. I'm Ooh. grateful for that. Because it's yes. not for the faint of heart. It's not for the faint of heart, but it is so worth it when you do the work. Yeah. Now, listener, Sparkler, what are you grateful for? Just take a second. We'll give you a little moment of quiet. Here you go. Um, say out loud something you're grateful for. Mm. Nice. It's a good one. Well done. Well done, Sparkler. Laura Camion. May I interest you in a fresh spark? I'll take that spark. I've got a spark for you. And I feel like it really does line up with some of the things we're talking about here. Great. In a, in a way, we'll, we'll get there. Okay. Maybe a long way to grandma's house, but we'll okay. get there. So I'm excited about this spark. My spark resources today include, of course, our friend Wikipedia, the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service Speaker Series, a good housekeeping article hey. for diversity and some things that I'm going to cite along the way. Great. No spoilers. Cams. Yeah, babe. You know, I think I've talked about this on the podcast for several years. I have partnered with the Metropolitan Opera on various projects. That's right. So let's be clear. No one is asking me to sing at the Met. Hey, and I think they're the worst for it. I really do. I think you might be the outlying opinion, but hold, it, <laughs> hold on to it. Um, I love your faith in me. Uh, what I do for the Met happily is that I conduct a lot of on-camera, on-mic interviews for them, and I help educators, starting with myself, to understand opera better. So I lead these conversations and conduct interviews around a just various topics related to opera. And we've even recorded an episode of the Spark File podcast at the Metropolitan Opera. Yes. So go back and give it a listen. Oh, that was so fun. Laura, who knew opera could be so fascinating and rich in history and complicated and sometimes problematic, but it is, it's deep. I mean, anything that goes back that far is likely. You are right. <laughs> I mean, likely to be problematic, but that is why we are recreating the world. That's right. So recently I'm moderating this conference at the Metropolitan Opera, and I feel like I won a contest because I had the good fortune of interviewing the great Irish actress, Fiona Shaw. Now, Woo! you may know Fiona Shaw from the Harry Potter movies. She plays Harry's aunt, Petunia Dursley, who lodges him in a cupboard under the stairs. How could she? How would she? Um, I think I first became aware of Fiona Shaw in the movie My Left Foot, starring Daniel Day-Lewis. Mm. Laura, do you remember that movie? I do. Not the entire plot of it, but I do remember it. Yeah. It's, uh, I went back and I rewatched the trailer when I was preparing the spark and I was like, oh my God, remember. Remember that? That was I remember a big going to, to the do movies. at the time. Yeah, yeah. He won the Oscar, right? I think he won the Oscar for that. That sounds right. Yeah. I'm going to say that sounds right, but I'd have to do my research It on was that. an important film, as they say. Well, his performances and hers, like the, yeah. the cast is great in that. Yeah. For, for our younger listeners, Fiona Shaw stars on Killing Eve. If you watch that show, she was on Fleabag. Before all that, she was a leading lady at the Royal Shakespeare Company and the National Theater, and she continues to have this unfucking believable career. In addition to being a great actress, Fiona Shaw is also she's a motherfucking genius. <laughs> I've interviewed her before, and I got to tell you, I was, I was just intimidated and a little anxious because interviewing her is like writing a really fast horse and you just have to hold on uh -huh. and uh -huh. like try not to fall off try to keep up yes Gen you're gently steering it you want to stay on the road 
Yeah, but but her brain, she cognates quickly. So <laughs> I, I was I was a little quick cognition. She she's really something. But she's also, in addition to being a great actress and a genius, she's an opera director. Wow. But the reason I was interviewing Fiona Shaw is because during the conference we were exploring the opera Medea. Oof. Some might know that as Medea. Medea. You say Medea, I say Medea. Say Medea. Uh-huh. But Fiona Shaw is recognized as one of the greatest stage Medeas of our time. Okay, can we just pause for one second? Yeah. Yes, of course. Is the differentiation in pronunciation, mm-hmm. where does that come from? And is are both correct? I think that you can call you can it's dealer's choice. Got I it. noticed when I was talking to Fiona. Mm-hmm. And when I was talking to anybody about the opera, they all pronounced it Medea. Uh-huh. And I was like, I've spent my life calling it Medea. Medea. And so, but I heard, I, I think it's, I'm going with, you can use whatever pronunciation okay. you okay. like. Good you to know. Say all right, thank you. I, I say, say Medea. Medea. So um, Fiona Shaw is recognized as this great stage Medea. And Cams, did you see that production of Medea? slash Medea, slash Tyler Perry's Medea. Um, Did you see that production of Medea that Fiona Shaw starred in on Broadway about 20 years ago? I did not. I know this is like a yieldy sparky, but... I did not. I didn't see it either. But she starred in this production of Medea, directed by her longtime collaborator, Deborah Warner, that played on the West End and on Broadway and at other theaters around that 2001, 2002 time. Mm -hmm. So we were living in New York then, but I don't know, maybe I wasn't spending my money on um, Broadway theater tickets. Yeah. I didn't, again, did not see that production, but I knew that I needed a Fiona Shaw slash Medea crash course, and I needed it real fast before this interview. (laughs) So where did I turn yieldy internet? Yeah. <laughs> yes, girl. Cam's lucky me. I found a recording mm. of that production, a sound recording oh. that had been made into a BBC radio program directed oh. by, you guessed it, Fiona Shaw. And then wow. I found the translation of Medea by Frederick Raphael and Kenneth McLeish, the, the script that was actually used in that production. Like I hit the, the Google jackpot. And this, this is the play, not the opera. This is the play. Right. This is the play. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I got to tell you, I got so, uh, and I'm going to unpack this in a second. I got so into this play that when she came to talk mm-hmm. with me and these educators about mm-hmm. Medea, I was just like, I'm going to crawl right up in there. I'm crawling up into this play and her performance of it, yes. which was completely appropriate. But I, I mean, uh, Laura Camion. How delicious. Laura. Oh, God. This is when I feel like I slash we have won a contest when it's like you see or you take in a great artist's work and then you get to turn to them and be like, can I ask you some questions? I got questions. Yes. It's awesome. Holy moly. So this Medea, including this production of the play, this translation, this recording, make up one part of my spark today. And that spark is creation about destruction. Oh, interesting. Creation about destruction. So you may have heard me talk on this very podcast Mm -hmm. about the cycles of creation, maintenance and destruction. Yeah that are presented in the Vedas. The Vedas are an ancient body of knowledge that is the foundation for things like acupuncture and feng shui and Ayurveda. Yeah. Veda means knowledge and specifically it's referring to the knowledge of nature. The Vedas are the human interpretation of natural law. And if you're a student of the, I learned all this from Emily Fletcher. If you're a student of the Vedas, it's all about getting in alignment with the flow of nature as opposed to rigidly working against nature's flow. And as a result, if you're working against nature, it will pummel you against the rocks. So in the Vedas, they talk about these cycles of creation, maintenance, and destruction, and they're all necessary. and They're all part of it. But Emily Fletcher talks about how If you prefer, like if you get into a maintenance mode in any part of your life, Mm -hmm. just know the next thing that's going to happen is destruction. 
Mm -hmm. If you're in maintenance, the next thing that's going to happen is destruction. So you can proactively choose, though all, all of those things are a part of a natural life well lived and part of a creative process, I believe, you can choose to habitually return to creation out of choice. Can I just say this out loud so I understand? Um, yeah. Like, for example, like in a relationship, like a yes. loving relationship. Yeah. I'm going to use the loving relationship that I have with West Day. Use it. So what I want to avoid is coming to the place where like, okay, it's done, it's complete. And now I'm just going to keep it like this, you got it. but rather that we remain in a state of like, we are co-creating this you got every it. day and we're choosing to be, okay, this is awesome. You got it. And I think we've all been in relationships where we slip into maintenance Yes, yeah. and then get, guess what comes next? Yeah. Destruction. Yeah. So, um, and that may be the, the wick on that might be very long before you get to the of sure. destruction, but you know, um, so today I want to talk about creation about destruction, which leads me back to Medea cams. How much do you know about Medea? And there is no shame in any, any amount of knowledge. Um, if I recall, did she kill her own children in the play? Yeah, yes. she does. So I remember spoilers, this. spoilers Spoiler. on a play written in 431 BC. If you haven't read it by now, um, <laughs> it actually, it makes me think of, do you remember when I talked about my friend Maria Santucci? Yes. Yes. There was a production of Medea done at our university that it was done the year before I arrived there. And it was it was, legendary? legendary and i believe it i believe that she yeah. is phenomenal in it yeah. so i mean i can't compare her to fiona shaw i don't know but i can say that everything i know about medea is from maria santucci i love that yeah. i love that so in, in a nutshell if you don't if you weren't able to talk to fiona shaw or like laura be close to the legend of maria santucci let me share a little bit about medea According to our friend Wikipedia, Medea was first performed again in 431 BC at the city Dionysia festival, where every year three tragedians competed against each other, each writing a tetralogy of three tragedies and a satyr play. Wait, can we stop for a second? I've never heard the word. Tragedians. Are there people who write tragedy? Is that? Uh, I think so. Uh, so wow. that like maybe is like a term for an ancient Greek writer of tragedies. Uh -huh, of tragedy. A tragedian. Not... You never the, intersected with that in theater history class? Or if I did, it was one of those words my eyes skimmed right over because I kind of <laughs> got the gist of it, but I never said it out loud. Say it, say it with me. Tragedian. Tra Tragedian. 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 I love that. Laura, while I was at the Met conference, I heard a word I had never heard before. And I was like, somebody like busted out this word, Antiphony. And I was like, did you just, in front of a whole, like a group of a hundred people, I was like, did you just say Antiphony? And I was like, we're gonna have to just pause for a second and teach, <laughs> teach Auntie Susan what Antiphony means. And this educator took the time to teach me what it oh, means. Oh, how fantastic. Which I was like, I used to be so shy and ashamed when I heard a word that I didn't understand what it meant, or I didn't know how to pronounce it, or I mispronounced it. I would just, because I'd only read it and I would, and I've just given that up. Like, absolutely. I'm like, so yeah, let's, let's hear it for a tragedian and let's hear it for Antiphony. I feel like you like follow behind me, picking up like words mispronounced and be like, um, Laura, <laughs> you dropped this. This is not this word. Say it, say it the right way. There's like a, I learn all the time from, cause I'm just sort of like, I'll just take a run at it. And, um, I love that about you. There's a word that I heard somebody say it recently. And I was like, I think it's an often misunderstood or misused word, which is penultimate penultimate penultimate, yeah. meaning the one before the final one, as opposed to 
the ultimate ultimate. The ultimate. At penultimate, but I heard somebody People say, use it as the ultimate all the time though, right? It, I think it means the one before the final one. Or the yeah. Mm-hmm. Penultimate. But I, I'm like, teach me, school me. Yeah, I want to learn. I'm sure I would have pronounced it antiphony if if I had been left to my own devices. If you saw it on paper. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I want you to repeat that sentence that you just said, because there were some golden words in okay. that. Here yeah. we go. Medea was first performed 431 BC at the City Dionysia Festival. I just love that there was a City Dionysia Festival. Here every year, three tragedians competed against each other, each writing a tetralogy <laughs> of three on. tragedies <laughs> and a satyr play. <laughs> This is That's an amazing a, that sentence. is just like an amazing assemblage of five dollar theater history words wow. right there. Wow! I think they could have thrown in Catherni. <laughs> they could have thrown in Cyclorama. Like there's so many words I mean, we didn't yeah, get to use in that really. sentence. They stopped that um, sentence a little short. <laughs> so just so you know, in 431 BC, this is the stiff competition that was running at the City Dionysia Festival. Oh, amazing! The competing playwrights were Euphorian who is the son of the famed playwright Aeschylus, Sophocles, who was Euripides' main rival, and our man Euripides, who wrote Medea. Oh, my God. Just so you know, Euphorian won, and Euripides plays last. Wow. But you know what? It's so interesting because, I mean, I don't know everything, but I've seen and I've read and I've studied a lot of theater. I've never heard of Euphorian, but I know Euripides. Yeah. I'm curious. I wonder what, I wonder why. Who, who lives, who dies, who, who tells, tells your, story? your story? Well, Euripides, I have to, I think the, the it was speculated, if I understand this correctly, and again, I'm not a theater historian. <laughs> I'm just a girl who can read Wikipedia. But Euripides placed last, and it may have been because this Medea, you gave us a play we were not asking for. We weren't prepared for this. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the plot. The story <laughs> of Medea is based on the myth of Jason and Medea, who are like a Bonnie and Clyde. They are like madly in love. They're totally hot. And they're totally hot for each other. Mm-hmm. And they are tearing around the world. Jason wants the golden fleece. And I think the golden fleece is, it's literally the fleece of some mythic creature. But I think it's a representation of great wealth mm-hmm. and a symbol of authority and kingship. Mm-hmm. But we'll just call it the golden fleece for short. Yeah. And so he wants that golden fleece. And he is on a boat called the Argos with his Argonauts, and he and Medea are tearing around the world on this boat. She's working her witchy ways, trying to get that golden fleece for him. But in pursuing this, they essentially leave scorched earth and burnt bridges and dead bodies everywhere they go. So if Jason and Medea have been there, bodies have hit the floor or the water, as the case may be. It is, I mean, it is a rip roaring. Because they have, they have supernatural powers, like their godlike powers, or they have. She an army. says repeatedly, they well, they have all the these boat. argonauts, which are these, uh, the I guess the sailors on the boat Argos. Oh. I never knew that. I thought like an argonaut was like an astronaut. Do you remember Jason and the Argonauts? That movie, that claymation movie, where he fights <laughs> skeletons in a sword fight. I don't know why I didn't know what an argonaut was until about two days ago. In any event, I'm learning right now. So <laughs> right, add good. that to our list of. The oldy dusty words. So <laughs> she likes to say over and over again, my father's father, the son. So she is literally oh. descended from, from the, the son. motherfucking son. Wow, that's some pedigree. But you know what I take away from that? If your father's father is the son, that shit will make you crazy. Crazy. It's too much. It's too much. It's too heat. much. It's too much heat. So, Laura, the things that that couple did, this is all story, this is all myth, but like the (laughs) things in the stories are crazy, crazy. From the myths, the myths that that transpired before 491 BC. 
I think I think this is coming from the miss. I don't think that her father's father was the son. I don't even know if these people. I don't think they actually lived. I think these are myths, right? Yeah. But this is where, like, that you're really reaching the edges of my theater history knowledge lore. Okay. Hey, listen. But and Greek mythology, like, but I do think Same. it's all born out of myth. Yeah. But all suffice it to say, these two, they're hot. They're hot for each other. They're destructive as hell, and they have. Like there's nowhere else for them to go. They are essentially now immigrants in Corinth and everyone everywhere else hates them. Jason could be described as a, the Fiona Shaw described him. They, they conceptualized him in their production as sort of like a David Beckham, just uh -huh. like fucking hot, but just like a status seeker. Huh. And Jason who he and Medea have had this hot, 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 hot relationship he falls for the princess of Corinth and plans to leave Medea and their two sons in order to marry that princess and secure, like he tries to spin it a bunch of different ways, like that he's doing it for them. Medea does not seem like somebody that you leave. She's not someone you fuck with, Laura. Mm -mm. Fuck around and find out. Should be on fuck a t-shirt that Medea wears. <laughs> so she, imagine she's like got all these powers. My father's father, the son. She's a little bit cray. And with her broken, angry heart, Medea starts to figure out how she can inflict maximum pain and heartbreak for the pain that she's experiencing. That's it. I couldn't remember why she kills her kids. And now it's all clear. Yes. She was super mad at him. Ugh. And then the play, like she's figuring out how to exact maximum pain. And then she starts killing people. So again, spoilers for a play that was written in 431 BC, but it's just like the king, his daughter, the princess whom Jason loves. And then honestly, even though we know how it turns out, shockingly, her two sons. So, you know, when I'm doing, when I'm preparing, before I really crack into research for this interview, I'm thinking 431 BC cams, Euripides, even with all that action, this has got to be one dusty old play. Oh. And then I hear this recording of Fiona Shaw and this great company of actors interpreting the story in such a raw human way and Camion, comma, <laughs> space, Laura. I was all holy fucking shit. You literally Brought hear life, huh? this. Oh my God. <laughs> It, it just this out of control human, this yeah. runaway train, this person who has victimized so many, who is like the ultimate open wound victim, yeah. considering what would be the most destructive path that I, this runaway train could take and throughout calibrating the plan to amp up the destruction even more. And the performances are so raw and so human and so nuanced. It is bananas. And then lucky me, again, I got to turn and talk to Fiona Shaw about all of this. I mean, really? Come on. What a gift. What is this life? So Fiona Shaw told me that she felt like, she was like, I really feel like we've got to the bottom of that piece. And I was like, you think, <laughs> Fiona Shaw? Because they understood it in such a deep, nuanced way because they had spent so much time on it. And again, we really do believe creating things of quality really can take a lot of time. But because they took that time, I could understand it from the jump. Yes. Yes. Indeed. So you know how sometimes you go to, you see like a classical play or a Shakespearean play and it takes a little bit before you slip into the groove of the language. Uh-huh. Yep. Killer Camion, this play is clear from the jump. Wow. It, there is no waiting for it to kick in. Like it kicks in from the top. So Fiona told me that the two guys who did the translation were two teachers and one of the things that struck me is that they use really clear language, penny words throughout. There's not big fancy SAT words. Mm -hmm. They're just these lovely penny words, which contributes to it being so accessible. And if I understand my theater history correctly, that would be in keeping with the time that the play was originally written in the Greek, that it wasn't, you know, this big impenetrable difficult to understand language. Well, yeah. I mean, it's taking place like a, a city 
festival, yeah, um, in a competition with other plays. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, but I love that. I I just uh, I love this play so much, Laura. I've been holding this in, waiting to deliver the spark because I wondered because we talked a little bit about how great it was to talk with Fiona Shaw, but you know, you and I, we would normally like unpack. And I was like, you, you held these cards close. That's to right. The chest. I was saving it for this moment. Yay. Um, you know, I said this to Fiona and to the audience there, but it felt so contemporary, Laura, it almost felt like true crime. If oh, that makes sense. Wow. Well, yeah, it's so interesting. You know, you, you and I were talking literally just the other day about a woman who true fact killed her children recently, like in the past year, it mm. having to do with like a belief of, um, some oh. conspiracy theories and yes. yeah, it's still shot. It's shocking now. It's shocking. Then it's shocking now when you read a story for any, for any reason, how and why someone yeah. could do that. Yeah. It seemed very, very contemporary. Another thing that I, it's so funny when I do these interviews, sometimes I'm just like, another thing I like about what you did is, but one of the things I told Fiona, <laughs> real professional, I make up for my lack of professionalism with enthusiasm. I told Fiona that documentary, I've said this to you, Laura, it's one of my favorite forms because you cannot beat, like you cannot beat it for nuance. Sometimes you see stuff in a documentary and you're like, you can't make that up. You can't. But because of the work that they had done to get to the bottom of the piece and because of the company's performing skills led by Fiona Shaw and directed by Deborah Warner, it is so endlessly nuanced. It really was as enjoyable for me as a documentary. Wow. So I'm telling you all of this because I was so sparked by this piece and I've got a little present <gasps> for all you sparkly listeners. What? I have created a hidden page on our website. <gasps> so if you go to the sparkfile.com slash M E D E A. I have posted the BBC radio <laughs> production of Medea, directed by and starring Fiona Shaw, and no the way. translation by Frederick Raphael and Kenneth McLeish. So if you like theater or true crime or Blumhouse horror movies or just really high quality shit, I recommend you carve out 75 minutes and go get your Euripides on. No way. Way. Laura. It's You've so been good. Sneaking around, making hidden website pages. I think it's so good. Now, if you listen to it and you're like, Blackwell. No, I know it's going to be incredible. I loved it. Uh, I've listened to it. I'm not even kidding. I think I've probably listened to it three or four times. Wow. But it's a real pleasure to listen to it and read yeah. along. Yeah. Like you're sort of like, I fully grasp the depth and the dimension of, of Medea written in 431 BC. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So this spark is actually a twofer though, Laura. Okay. What else you got? I'll tell you what else I got. My friend, Ashley Van Buren. <gasps> hi, Ashley. Ashley. Hi. Ashley saw on somebody's social media, God knows it wasn't mine, that I was interviewing Fiona Shaw at the Met. And she left me this message saying, oh my God, Fiona Shaw, that's so cool. But you know who's really cool? Fiona Shaw's wife. Her memoir is one of my favorite books. And, you know, I'm always down to clown with a good spark. You're so I got me. a copy of that book that You're Ashley recommended. You're kidding me. And that was written by a woman named Sonali Dharana Yagala. Sonali Dharana Yagala is a Sri Lankan economist. And that book is called Wave. Laura Camion, are you familiar with a book called Wave? Susan, I am Don't not. look it up. Don't I'm look not. it up. No, I'm not. Okay. I'm just leaning forward towards Don't my look mic. it up. Okay. I don't know that. Book. I didn't mean to be that. I didn't mean to be that aggressive. That Sorry. was awfully sharp. I know. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. I just want to maintain a little mystique. So, just uh, kidding. So Sonali was born in Sri Lanka and she studied economics at Cambridge and has her doctorate from Oxford. Fancy. Uh -huh. When Sonali was 18 years old and an undergrad at Cambridge, she met Steve Lissenberg and they eventually married and gave birth to two boys, Vikram and Molly. In December of 2004, when the boys were five and seven, the whole family, including Sonali, her two sons, her husband, her parents, her good friend Orlantha and Orlantha's parents were on Christmas vacation at a hotel in Sri Lanka's Yala National Park. And the day after Christmas, they were packing up to leave within the hour and her husband was in the bathroom 
and the boys are jumping up and down on their beds, playing with their Christmas oh. presents. And she's chatting with her friend. And her friend was saying, I want what you have. <gasps> what you have is a dream. Oh, God. And Sonali had her back to the windows. And then her friend Orlantha, who was facing the windows that looked out at the ocean, said, look at the ocean, which is usually a flat line miles in the distance. But it was especially foamy. And it seemed to be coming closer. Oh, no. And Sonali called to her husband to come look at something odd. And what they were seeing oh, was a no. tsunami hitting the coast where their hotel was located, a tsunami of epic scale that took an estimated 230,000 lives across a dozen countries. And within the hour, Sonali's entire family, her husband, her sons, her parents, and also her friend Orlantha and her friend's mother, Beulah, were all killed. Oh, my God. To use Sonali's words, her life as she knew it ended. When you said the name of the book, I was like, is it related to the movie? Because didn't um, Naomi watts do a movie i think she did i i yeah i don't i haven't watched it 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 is intense this story i haven't watched it either is incredible and when you tell me that fiona shaw then married this woman yeah my mind is like sparking off so much i can't even i can't even talk these connections between the loss the Oh God. Yeah. It's intense. It's, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, it's it's hard. hard. So it took, as you can imagine, it <sighs> took Sonali years to process through this loss and this destruction. For about two years, she stayed at a relative's house in Sri Lanka in a darkened room. And she was essentially guarded by friends and family in an attempt to keep her safe and tended to and distracted and alive during a time when she did not want to be alive at all. Oh, God. And according to Sonali, so many everyday images, things that we generally think of as positive, but just everyday things like sunshine, Mm -hmm. a blade of grass, a man's shoe, a dimple on a child's face, the smell of bread Mm. would fill her with terror. So she tried, she said she tried to shrink her sight and minimize her exposure to anything that would remind her of her life before and what she had lost, which I mean, everything. So she just stayed in this darkened room and essentially numbed herself by any means necessary. So by alcohol or by tablets, like she just tried to, what I'll use her words, minimize her sight. She tried to minimize her exposure and shrink her sight so that she wouldn't be hit, struck by this terror. Oh, it's just so much pain. It's just like, it's hard. Um, it's hard to fathom. That and- much loss. And just, I, I, you know, how she survived when they didn't, like I, a, any person who survived that uh, tsunami, I understand is like, it's just some sheer luck yeah. yeah, of some tiny little change in circumstance for them in the midst of it all that didn't happen for others who were in the water. Yeah. I have listened to her story told by her and her writing and I was thinking about that, like, because of, and she describes it so clearly, moment by moment, but imagine water, Mm -hmm. just like this massive roaring current, say it's going 55 or 60 miles per hour, is moving you across trees and overturn cars and you're banging into things and getting cut up by things. And I was like, the chance of her and moving you fast, you know, mile after mile after mile, really fast that she survived the odds that she survived are just nuts. And she just happened to, she describes it where this water is moving her and she saw a branch, a tree branch, and she stuck her arms up and back, not thinking, just, just reacting and responding 
viscerally and physically and caught it and held on to it. And that is what she held on to until the water receded and she was just sort of left in this muddy, desolate wasteland. So she pulled herself up out of the water a little bit or like just enough, like holding on and the water passed her. I think she held on to it until, because it's a big wave. So it comes yeah. in and eventually it goes, it goes back, back out. out. Well, yeah. I was going to say that even if she's stationary now because she's holding on to this branch, there is still stuff in that water that can knock into her slice, slice uh -huh. a person, cut a person. I just, yeah, it's, it's terrifying. Yeah. I thought it was so interesting though, when I'll talk more about the, her, the, her creative process around writing this book, but I thought it was so interesting. She talked about how writing about the wave, she calls it the wave, mm -hmm. writing about the wave was not where the terror came from for her. Mm -hmm. Not a fear of like water or oceans. It was the terror of the things that would trigger her memories of her life before. I thought that was really fascinating. Because what would happen if she thought about, it would like open up a um, an opening for too much pain to flood I in? think it was so excruciatingly painful yeah. for such a prolonged yeah. a, a period of time because of the the immensity of the loss. She likened it, the loss to a meteorite hitting the earth and the extinction of the dinosaurs in a moment. Oh, but she's talking about her family. And she said that for years, she was just in this stupor of disbelief. And one of the manifestations of her trauma was not only did it really happen, but did my family even exist? Oh, did I wipe God. my boys' noses? Did my husband oh, come in no. at six o'clock and throw his keys on the, you know, counter? Oh, no. And so she had this long period of this traumatic, almost like, what is real? What? Because if you can imagine the cognitive dissonance of that, of mm -hmm. going from the kids are jumping up and down on the bed. We're just wrapping up. We're packing oh. our bags and trying to get our shit together to get out of the hotel in the next hour. And a friend being like, man, I'd love to start a family. What you have is a dream. And the next moment, you're essentially running for your life. But she had this very long period of seeking numbness and seeking forgetting. And eventually, she landed in New York City. And she worked with a therapist who encouraged her to write about her experiences. And she said she thought it was ridiculous. She didn't want to live let alone write. Right. So she was just like, oh my God, are you kidding me? The other thing that's so great about her writing is it's so honest. Mm. It's so frank. And she, I don't know, man, like she pulls no punches. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, it's a little bit like when we've talked about this with David Sedaris, sometimes that's not flattering to her yeah, because she really tells you what thoughts were going through her head. Yeah. And especially after the wave and after all that loss, there was a lot of anger yeah. and a lot of like, fuck you. Are you fucking kidding me? Like a, a lot of anger. And, and so, but she's, she's so honest about it. In my opinion, I think that when people are that honest to the degree where it's not flattering for themselves, I appreciate it so much. And I feel like that is how we heal because we learn that other people have those thoughts that have run through their minds as well. Because if we're being honest with ourselves, we have some ugly thoughts that run through our minds. Yeah. And yeah. it's, you know, part of being human. And I yeah. appreciate it when someone can be that honest. I really appreciated it. So she, you know, the therapist is suggesting, why don't you write about this? And she was like, you're fuck that and fuck you. Mm -hmm. But she said, eventually she began writing much kicking and screaming, but she eventually began writing. And I stress this for herself. She wrote for herself to understand yes. what happened to her, to write about the water and the wave and what happened on that day. And even though she had experienced the wave and the water and what happened on that day, she said there was still that it felt biblical or mythic. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to understand what actually happened to her in the water. Mm. And to do that, she had to put herself back there to grasp the impossibly unreal experience. 
And as she wrote, she remembered all kinds of startling facts from that day. She was kind of recovering memories that uh, were coming back to her. She remembered floating on, there was a moment where she was being moved by the water and she was floating on her back in this, in these rapids, looking up at a spotless blue sky, because remember this wasn't caused by a storm. Mm -mm. This was caused by tectonic shift under Mm -hmm. the ocean, essentially an earthquake under the ocean. So she's looking up at the spotless blue sky, seeing a flock of birds flying in formation in the same direction as the water was taking her and her, her whole family loved uh, birds and bird watching. There's a lot of beautiful bird imagery in this book, but she is laying there in the middle of this fucking tsunami and she's looking up in there and she's like, are those kind of storks are those, those are painted storks and thinking, Oh, Vic would love seeing those painted storks. And she remembered how little facts like that were so important for her because it helped her to bring reality back to herself and her life Uh and also to grasp the bizarre and the unfathomable about the whole situation. She said writing about the wave and the water was the easy part. And as I mentioned earlier, gradually over the years, she wrote more and more and she wrote to bring her family back to her, to bring back the threads of her life And to remember it, not just intellectually, but to remember the feelings. And for her, that was hard. In the same way that I think it was a terror about the blade of grass, the smell of bread, a man's shoe. It was hard to remember and write about making breakfast for her boys in the kitchen and her boys messing around with the eggs and her, you know, scolding them. And that it was painful and terrifying to remember that. But she said... Even though remembering and writing about her life before was agony, it was a better quality of agony than trying to forget. I felt that I was cohering in a certain sort of way. From the moment it happened, I felt like I was in bits and pieces spinning around. And the writing, especially bringing my family close and writing about them, I felt myself cohering. This is who I really am. Mm. One of the beautiful things about this book is that you see slowly over the course of the book, the progress of her grief. It may have felt sometimes to her, I can only imagine because she endured it for so long, that it felt like she wasn't moving. But you see, it's sort of like a photo developing or the sun rising. You see her grief progressing and moving. And it's shifting. That's incredible. I just kept thinking about, and I'm jumping to what do we make of it, but I just kept thinking about if you are lucky enough to live long enough, we all are going to go through some shit Mm -hmm. to varying degrees. And I will remember this book the next time I am going through something as a reminder of a lot of things. And one of the things is to keep putting one foot in front of the other, to continue trying, even when it's terrifying, to be self-expressed in order to keep moving, in order to keep like moving through the pain and the grief of it all. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, in in that way, the title is genius. The wave is... I mean, yeah. the grief comes in waves and yeah. the fact that she was able to, thanks to that therapist who it seemed like she wanted to tell, you know, to fuck off when she had the idea of writing. She also stresses they were a very good therapist. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I got that from what you said. <laughs> um, and that she obviously followed through on it and how great that she was able to start writing at a certain point and it is like like the wave you can actually see her process happening as she's writing yeah it's extraordinary yeah yeah that writing also paved the way for her to take important steps like returning to her family home in london which her friends had tended to while she was healing from the trauma and through the writing, she realized that what they had as a family was so beautiful and she wanted to experience it again. She was able to move through the terror and get back to wanting to experience it again and not just write about it from memory. So after years, she went back 
And as I said, her friends had kept her home exactly as she had left it years earlier. Oh. There were still toys unopened, like Christmas <gasps> presents waiting there oh. from because they had yeah. there were things that they were going to open when they got back yeah. from their holiday. Um, the beds were still made just as they had left it. The kids' cricket equipment and stuff like that. And she said, as impossible as it was to return, she felt an ease and a lightness. And while this writing was originally for her and an extension of her therapy, what she ultimately created from all of this was this book called Wave, which recounts her experiences in the tsunami and the progression of her grief over the ensuing years. And Laura, we frequently say, if you have to live through it, if you have the choice, but you could make something out of it. And boy, did she make something out of it? Why did she? It is so well written. This book is so well written. As I mentioned, it's very honest. It is unsentimental. The nuance, the detail, the richness, there are details that you would not believe if you saw them portrayed in a movie. Mm -hmm. But it, she is so factual and she's such a reliable narrator. Mm. You're like, yeah, that's how that went down. I just keep thinking. And as we heal ourselves, we heal others. Yeah. You know, if we are willing to share truly and authentically what comes out of our pain, I do believe we have the opportunity to heal others. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Laura. It's creation about destruction. It's creation out of destruction. Mm -hmm. um, I watched this great talk with her at the Clinton School. And when asked what readers might take away from her book, she said, well, you know, that's up to each reader. But she offered the theme of love endures. Aww. Even when life vanishes in an instant, even in the absence of the physical form, love doesn't die. <sighs> which I thought was, I mean, you know, because you recently taught a beautiful session on sort story structure. Theme is really open to interpretation. And yeah, it's just, it's important for authors, writers to know what the theme is. But I was like, that's a beautiful potential theme for that. Um, wow. When the book was released, Cheryl Strayed wrote about it for the New York Times. And these are Cheryl's words. The word brave is used a lot to describe those who write about their deepest traumas, too often, I think, but it's an apt description of Dharana Yagala. She has fearlessly delivered on memoir's greatest promise to tell it like it is, no matter the cost. The result is an unforgettable book that isn't only as unsparing as they come, but also defiantly flooded with light. Mm. So apparently after reading the book, Fiona Shaw contacted Sonali and wanted to meet her. And in an interview in Good Housekeeping, Fiona Shaw said, we spent half an hour chatting. And when I left, I thought, I have just met life. Oh. And in 2018, they started dating and the couple got married after Sonali proposed to Fiona. And they are still together to this day. Laura Camion just lost it. I'm sorry. I can't even say those words back. That, um... I have just met life. I have just met life. That's, that's an incredible thing to express about someone and about someone who has gone through what we know yeah. she's gone through. So much loss, so much destruction. Oh, Suze, what an amazing spark. Oh, Laura. I feel like I put you through the washing machine. You did, but I don't mind it. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> we like I'll take that ride. We like a good cry here at the Spark File. While yeah, Laura while Laura ride. wipes her tears on the sleeve of her sweatshirt, let's do a little what do we make of it? So if you're Sonali, Dharana Yagala, you make a book. And super bonus, she's also an economist and she is using <laughs> her powers to research the economic implications of natural disasters on poverty especially oh wow so yeah. whether it's a tsunami yeah. or a drought which leads to famine whether it's happening hurricanes. yeah whether it's ha yeah. it's hurricane katrina she's she is um you know partnering to do research i think she's still at columbia here in new york She's really something. If you love theater or are a student of theater or acting or the classics, 
go to the sparkfile.com slash M E D E A and take in that Medea. Um, if you're going through it and Lord knows at some point, if you live long enough, we're all going to go through it. Know that if you choose, you can use your creative self-expression to process all of it. If you choose, you can use the raw material of your lived experience to make something beautiful that may be of healing to yourself and to others. So those are a few, what do we make of it? Amen. Amen. How are you doing over there, just, baby cams? Uh, doing good. Doing good. I just think about how often we really encourage um, ourselves and others to take what may feel like the biggest pain point in your life and put it in the light and begin creating from it. You can decide later if you want to share it with the world or That's not. That's right. But to begin creating yeah. from destruction, as you've you've given us two glorious examples of that today, but creating from destruction and then, um, you know, do it in service of yourself to heal yourself and then decide if you want to use it to help others as well. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Oh, and serious. you know, we, yeah, we were talking uh, in the spark file today in blaze about there are these things. I mean, everybody has these there, but for the grace of God, go eyes, you know, these things that to varying degrees are just unfathomable. And it takes, be patient with yourself and take the time you need. That's right. Therapy, a good therapist is always in good taste, That's right. but I love the healing possibility of creativity. I love it. Me too. I love it for ourselves and for the people that may one day get to take that in. So me too. All right. That's it. <laughs> Friends, I hope you go watch that or listen to that Medea and read along. You're in for a treat. Uh, yeah. You're in for a treat. I love that you made that little, thank you for that gift, Susan. This whole thing was a gift and an extra special little gift on our website. I'm excited to go check it out. You're a gift, Laura Camion. That's it. Yeah. You are gift to sparklers. You're all gifts. Thanks, everybody. This episode of The Spark File was made on the lands of the Lenape people. And as always, we hope this put another bunch of sparks in your file. Listen there's a spark you'd like us to explore, or if you'd like to learn more about how to coach with us to bring your creative ideas to life, you can email us at thesparkfile at gmail.com or submit it through our website, thesparkfile.com. We will even happily take your feedback, but you know the price of admission. First, you got to share a creative risk that you've taken recently. You can follow us on social at The Spark File and be sure to subscribe, rate, and five-star review this podcast. It really does help other <laughs> listeners find us. Also, if you like this podcast, we hope you'll share it with people that you love. And if you didn't like it, we will go full Medea on your ass. You don't want that, do oh. you? Our father's father was the oh. sun, motherfuckers. <laughs> If something lights you up and gets your creative sparks flying, we are writing you a forever permission slip to make that thing that's been knocking at your door. It's your turn to take that spark and fan it into a flame. You know, you got to take it and, and make, make it. it. Bye, friends. Mwah. When I bump into something that inspires me, I dump it in my spark fire. Could be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my spark file. I jump into my spark file. Let's open up the spark file. Hi friends, Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illume, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illume, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an 
an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. Illum.